Vietnam is America's longest war. For the veterans, it is a silent homecoming. The country wants to forget Vietnam. The soldiers cannot. Fifty-seven thousand come home in flag-draped coffins. One hundred and fifty thousand return on stretchers. An estimated half a million have serious emotional problems. The majority, two million, return home unscarred by the war itself. But all are touched by the war's unpopularity. Their service and sacrifice goes largely unsaluted. Society said, you didn't win your war, we won our wars. You know, you guys are losers. And they're not losers. And when I go around, I tell them there's somebody. And because I'm a loser, according to their standards, they want nothing to do with me. I think, I think when I was wounded in Vietnam, my blood ran just as heavily, and my pain was just as heavily as my fathers and other fathers of Vietnam veterans. They got a guilt, too, the people that sent us there. They know what they, what they back was wrong. They know what they did was wrong. But we're the ones that are carrying the mark for them. The war, a statement that I make to my the war is never going to be over for me. The war is never going to be over for any man that fought it. He's going to go to his grave with that war. It is hardest for those closest to the combat. This is their history. This society became hostile and, in many ways, alien to the Vietnam veteran. There was never really that homecoming. Times Square, 1945, a celebration of victory in World War II. It is the reference point for the GIs who go to Vietnam. They have faith there is sufficient cause. After two world wars, then Korea, America's patriotism is unquestioned. Now, a new generation goes to war with the same sense of duty. Most go with a simple creed, a belief that when America calls, that call must be answered. The slogan was, my country, right or wrong. Many came to describe it as a service to the American dream. I bought an American dream. And because of possibly some of that upbringing, I still believe a little bit in that American dream. But I don't believe in it anymore in the way that it, it was taught to me. I question more now. About one in three GIs sent to Vietnam see direct combat. Two million rotate through as rear echelon troops. Another six million Vietnam era veterans never saw these shores, serving at support bases throughout the world. Among the half million who see combat, an unprecedented number are seriously wounded. I got shot through the stomach. I stopped, I stopped eight bullets. We got caught in an ambush. I was on a point with uh, two of the machine gun crews, and I was a head machine gun crew, and I got a grenade in the back. I was shot in the back, both legs, stabbed in the left arm through hand-to-hand -hand combat. I was paralyzed in my right hand. I had strap metal on my back, my feet my head, and I had 40% of my body. My last wound was burnt with napalm. And um, 
second and third degree burns. It was the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me in my life. Those seriously wounded survive in Vietnam because of advanced medical and transport techniques. Helicopter mobility saves them. Medical rescue teams are able to evacuate casualties in the midst of combat. A wounded officer who becomes an expert on battlefield medicine, Captain Max Cleland. There was a development in terms of medevac by chopper, coupled with high technology available on the battlefield that saved guys like me that would have died in World War II or Korea. The technology includes portable field hospitals. In major engagements, inflatable clinics and emergency wards are brought to the battlefield. The care is often better than the veteran will receive back home. Intricate surgery of every kind is available close to the combat zones. One man who is saved this way, Captain Cleland. The survival rate uh, in Vietnam was highest of any modern war. In World War II, the survival rate for uh, getting wounded there was 71%. Uh, uh, it was about 74% in Korea, but it was 82% uh, in Vietnam. We suffered 10,000 guys who lost a limb. 10,000 amputees out of Vietnam. You had more arms, legs, and eyes lost in Vietnam than in World War I and Korea combined for American forces. So in Vietnam, you stood a better chance of being seriously disabled and surviving it than any previous war. On the emotional level, you stood a better chance of having doubts about the rationale of that sacrifice. Captain David Christian won a dozen medals. I had the last rites twice. I remember the priest giving me the last rites. He was, I woke up and I was in a semi-state of shock. And I started screaming, you know, there can't be any justice, there's no God, why, why me? You know, I, I'm only 19 years old, Father, please. I come back with hundreds and hundreds of, of crippled men whose bodies were wrecked in Vietnam, and we aren't perceived with dignity. I spent two years as an inpatient in hospitals, and then I spent six years as an outpatient. Came home, and our, my refuge was I was in the hospital. I felt comfortable in the hospital, filled with, with bodies that were wrecked from war. Guys missing eyes and legs and noses and their faces torn apart. I was comfortable among these people. They were my comrades. The contrast in treatment back home angers them. A paraplegic Bobby Murdoch on the adjustment. When I became a spinal cord injury, I learned, started learning quick what you expect and what not to expect as far as care. You just got to learn to plan your life and start all over again. It takes a lot of patience, go through a lot of frustrations. Among the 300,000 Americans wounded in Vietnam, 30,000 men come home totally disabled. It takes years of rehabilitation before they re-enter American life, often because the public cannot accept the reminders of an unpopular war. Another reason, some government hospitals are inadequate. Veteran Lou Carello recalls one. Uh, they took me to the Bronx, and I, I swear to God, I thought I was going to prison. I mean, big, long hall. Uh, the ceilings were so high. This is an old building, you know. And I got in there, and uh, I stayed there about six months. But the drugs in there, you mean, easier to get in there than they are in the street. And the rats and the roaches were there, you know. I had a friend of mine who was a total quadriplegic. He must have had a rat on him that must have weighed about three or four pounds on top of his chest, and he couldn't get it off. And two of his pairs jumped into the chair and knocked this thing off with a cane and killed it, you know. Across the country, the veterans protest hospital conditions. I got hurt in uh, 105 Hollister. I got too close to the muzzle, and I have headaches, and I've been having headaches ever since then. I go in this hospital, they turn me down. When I was in the hospital, I saw the doctors coming around they were putting guys out of the hospital with disabilities, severe disabilities, and telling them to go to another administration, go to the VA. The Veterans Administration is a $22 billion a year agency. For years, the VA regards Vietnam's casualties as no different to other wars. In 1976, the VA gets a new director, Max Cleland. 
I think what happened was that the country was not prepared. Not only the Veterans Administration was not prepared, uh, or that the government wasn't prepared to deal with casualties, but the country was not prepared to deal with high costs of the war, either financial or in personal terms. Cleveland himself is among the worst casualties. He lost both legs and his right arm in 1968 in a helicopter assault. So I got off, got out from under the chopper there. The chopper took off. I turned around and I saw a grenade there. Well, immediately I thought it was mine. And just before I touched it, it went off. Cleland and others like him must overcome terrible physical wounds and still face another trauma, the reaction of loved ones. Family life becomes a casualty of the war. My first thought was of my parents. I'm an only child. How would my parents react to their only child getting virtually blown away? Um, my immediate question was, were they going to love me? Were they going to accept me or not? How am I going to explain this whole thing to my friends? I mean, my, 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 my boyhood uh, chums that I played basketball with and baseball with and swam and, and ran around the neighborhood. I mean, what am I going to say? You know, uh, that you went to Vietnam and got all screwed up. I, I thought about it, and, uh, and yet I didn't realize how deeply other people are affected by somebody uh, seriously disabled. They're deeply affected. My father had a great guilt complex. My mother, instinctively, the first few years reacted in an overprotective manner. My friends were immediately affected. One guy, when he, when he heard the news, went out and threw up. One lady actually avoided me for years because she couldn't face me. Uh, you're going to have this kind of emotional overload on friends and family. But I think it was, uh, it was even made worse by the reaction of the country toward Vietnam. We handed out 29,000 boys from my county alone went and fought in Vietnam. That's a hell of a lot. My two brothers served over there. My one brother spent four years there. Today, the three of us are disabled from the service. The trauma of war is no different. So therefore, the respect and dignity should be the same. I was only 17 when I went in. I couldn't explain the magnitude of Vietnam at that time. And at 20 years of age, I knew how to fight a war, but I didn't know the reasons why or why not. Some veterans cannot forget what the war did to Vietnam. At boot camp, they attack a mock Vietnamese village. Marine Jack McCloskey. It was taught to us of saying, you go into this ville, and you have to blow everything away in this ville. And you begin to do that because your, your basic mistrust of the Vietnamese people is already ingrained in you. Anything with slant eyes, anything was a, that was a gook was a gook. They were not human beings. And we were always told, as long as you don't make human contact with them, with the hands, you will always see them as the enemy. But once you touch him, you're going to find out he's got flesh and blood like you do. Marine Lou Corello lost both legs in Vietnam. But like many others, he is also traumatized by the nature of the war, by what it did to his mind. I was part of a team that killed civilians, civilians who were in key spots. I was like a hired gun, you know. I still can't sleep without a light on. All the people maybe that I either put away or help put away are going to get me. One of the nightmares I still have about it is having my medic bag by me and reaching down, reaching, reaching for a battle dressing, and that battle dressing turns into a body bag. And I can't, I still can't get over that. It becomes an individual struggle to put the war behind them. By 1968, the wounded are coming home in ever-increasing numbers, arousing new civil protest. The country was, uh, was going through a national nervous breakdown. The country went through more history than we could consume, and certainly more history than the average citizen could explain. 
the whole anti-war movement really grew and peaked in 68, and uh, the message came through loud and clear to me, loud and clear to my family, and loud and clear to my friends and family, that somehow, uh, you know, maybe this veteran uh, got wounded for nothing. One Washington march draws a thousand veterans. Many are from middle America, now radicalized by their Vietnam experiences. Years pass before America understands them. The rationale for your service and sacrifice begins to be pretty thin. And uh, it's, an emo it's kind of an emotionally trying time to begin trying to put your life back together. And you're looking especially at the past to see how you got to where you are. And, uh, and the past becomes uh, less and less rational. The past becomes uh, less and less acceptable to the American people. And you begin to be identified as the uh, character in the story that went wrong. Some are prone to violence, a police problem. This becomes the public stereotype of the Vietnam veteran. For some years, a disproportionately high number of prisoners in federal jails are Vietnam veterans. Most of their crimes are drug-related. They blame mental problems, which they call post-Vietnam syndrome. For these men, rap or therapy sessions with fellow veterans are their mainstay for many years. One young veteran serving 12 years for manslaughter tells of his homecoming. No one to talk to, no psychiatric help. He killed a man for drug money. In Vietnam, he saw his Marine unit wiped out then he killed a civilian. I fired, fired a burst of about five or six at her, and she hit the ground and rolled over, and I, I knew it was a girl then, and I just, it just flashed through my mind all the complications I'd have uh, going over there. She's still alive, so I just went ahead and killed her. We came across civilians, uh, burn their house, take, take what you wanted out of it, you know, mess with their women. Stuff like that it was, uh, you know, it was just a nasty way to treat the people. When I got back from Vietnam, I, I had nobody talked to me or anything, you know. It was just, well, okay, you made it back, great, man. Do what you want now. And uh, what I should have done now, I see, is should have got a psychiatrist or somebody that could, uh, I could tell these things to. I don't really know what it made me. It made me sorry, I guess. Another Marine, wounded medic Jack McCloskey, begins a self-help veterans group, visiting prisons and hospitals. I'm 60%. My neck's been totally fused. I've had seven cervical operations. My family's probably suffered more than I have, really, because mm -hmm. I'm kind of a bear to live with. I think your anger is <laughs> righteous and valid. I think also from the anger, I've, I've learned a little patience. That I have to be patient. That I have to still hope. If, if, if I didn't hope, then I could never regain my innocence, and I want to regain my innocence. We had the prettiest yeah, equipment. Nothing. We had the most beautiful equipment. We had guns that were beautiful. Let, let, let me finish. We could put in, it was a 20, let me finish. I think the problem being here is... And much later on, using trained psychiatrists, the government starts a program called Operation Outreach. And no, if I told anybody I was a Vietnam vet, they thought I was a killer. I was called a murderer. So I shut up. I withdrew for seven years. And over those seven years, that's the worst thing I could do. It built up inside of me. And so here I am in the group. It's something that, that, that my, my, my mind bleeds from hell when I go back to Vietnam, I, but it never leaves my head. Let there was a war there where our friends died and we killed people. We understand what that means, but the rest of America doesn't. It's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of alienation. To me, those things are signs of sanity. They're not insane. How else could you come out of that situation not feeling that? 
One of the most profound effects that Vietnam has had in this country is that we have lost touch with our sense of caring. We have always been known as a country that cares. And Vietnam's changed that a little bit. 60% of the veterans take up socially oriented jobs or return to school. They are aided by 2,000 self-help groups across America. Years later, the VA opens up storefront clinics. The VA's problem is to get veterans and society to accept each other. The difficulties are greater for black veterans. In the early years, blacks suffer a higher casualty rate, and back home, social tensions make rehabilitation harder. By 1980, the VA states that one in three quarter million veterans still need emotional counseling. But new programs help. When I was in a veteran's hospital up there, I went back to Colorado, and within about a week, someone on the Colorado Wheelers got a hold of me, and the next thing I knew, I was out square dancing. It's just one of those things where we can go out and, and dance for a, a group of regular square dancers, and they see us do it, and they realize that we're all just out there doing the same thing, and that's mainly having a good time. Don't look at the Vietnam veteran as a drug-addicted, forgotten loser who is no good to this society. The converse is really the case. The fact of the matter is that the average Vietnam veteran has undergone probably more physical and emotional stress than most anybody as a group in his generation. He has survived that. He is a survivor of the toughest kind of warfare, both psychological and physical. And he is able, because of that, to be a better human being and appreciate life more and contribute more to it. We now are sending some 66% of our Vietnam era veterans back to school. By the early 80s, we will have sent more Vietnam veterans back to college than we did after World War II. We're turning out, in effect, the most educated group of young men that we've ever sent to war. Lou Carello goes back to school to study sociology. He hopes to counsel other veterans. He looks to the future. The past, he says, is painfully personal. I don't want people to know my whole story. I just want you to leave me the hell alone and let me go. But understand me when you see me. In a government-sponsored opinion poll, a majority of Americans call Vietnam the wrong war in the wrong place. This verdict comes 15 years after Americans first go into combat. From the hills of Khe Sanh to the shores of Da Nang. From the Dak Tho Valley to the Iron Triangle. From the Mekong Delta to the DMZ. Vietnam adds to America's military roll call. Bardstown, Kentucky, small town America. The people recall how Vietnam reached into their town. I guess you might say that probably most of us didn't want to go. Uh, we realized that we had to, and. You know, we'd been taking the government's money as a reserve unit, and um, it was time for us to do our thing. We were asked to go, so we went based on that. I don't think anybody wants to go to war. Well, I was um, shaken up, no question about that, but uh, I felt that it was right, it was the thing to do, and I was in that unit, and I was willing to do my part. No qualms, I thought we were and I think I'm speaking with the majority of the people in our community that <clears throat> felt that we were doing the right thing. I can give you guys some heroes, I'm sure, that, uh, you know, looking for medals and this kind of stuff, but we weren't that 
that kind of people. This is the heartland of America, where history is made and judged. It is the second oldest town in Kentucky, population 5,800. Nine churches, three factories, one art gallery. Bardstown is bourbon, and the inspiration of the song, My Old Kentucky Home. I really don't think it was worth what we lost. I don't think it was worth the, the men that we lost over there, the number of men we lost. I don't think it was worth the money that was poured into the country. I, I don't think any way, shape, or form it was uh, worth anything to the United States government for what went on and what was lost. And uh, uh, I don't want to say that my buddy's lives are wasted. Uh, we were asked to do a job, and we attempted to do that job. Now, I don't agree with the way we went about it. And he kept telling me, don't cry, Mama, I'll be back. But when I look back, the last look, I could see tears running down his eyes. But he, he was a good soldier, and he believed in it. He was scared. He, um, I think he was really scared that something might happen. Bardstown men join a National Guard artillery battery. Its 500 men are called to active duty May 1968. 100 go to Vietnam. Several stay together, assigned to fire base Tomahawk north of Da Nang. They fire artillery support for the infantry. They write home about the boredom of battlefield life. But they are together and have been since childhood. Being from the same town seems like a good idea. They serve seven months on a hilltop. June, 1969. A sudden night assault causes heavy casualties at Firebase Tomahawk. Some Bardstown men miss the attack. Their relatives get confusing reports. But they really wanted to know exactly what did happen, because they'd heard so many things. And they wanted to talk with someone who had first-hand knowledge and of course, several of the other men had better knowledge about it than I did because uh, I wasn't there until, until we could fly in the next morning. Four Bardstown sons die on one day. The community tries to understand. One of the fellows, uh, the father asked me, where was he? You know, do you know exactly what happened? Do you know how he was killed? And this type of thing. And, and, and really, I couldn't answer those questions because I wasn't really at that part of the on that part of that end of the hill at the time it had happened. So I couldn't really give him a straight answer. I got one letter that was telling me that he was standing guard, uh, watch uh, over his men. He saw the Vietnams coming. And when he turned and ran to tell him to get in the foxhole, he was hit by a grenade. In all, 15 Bardstown men die in Vietnam. Where, how, why? Was there meaning? Relatives reach for those last moments so far away. One will tell you one thing and another will tell you another one. You never really know what happened. Really, me, I never really found out what happened. I've been told some things, but knowing what really happened, I didn't. The town was shook. There was no question about it. There was uh, not only uh, families that were involved, but just people in general. You just almost couldn't believe it. You know, it just something like that just don't happen, but it happens. And those who directed the war, the policymakers, generals, and ambassadors, all come to ask, what went wrong in Vietnam? Well, the, the first thing about Vietnam is that the, the campaign, the, the military, the US, the, the, the American effort in Vietnam uh, w was undertaken without adequate planning. You couldn't say that we were saving the world from Ho Chi Minh. No one in their senses expected that if Ho Chi Minh won in Vietnam, that he would, next week his legions would appear in Malibu Beach. Uh, the American military establishment and our political leaders not only could not deliver that swift military victory, but could not even define what that victory was. What do we want? Peace! When do we want it? Now! You want it, Tucker? What do we want? Peace! When do we want it? Now! Can we want it? Peace! When do we want it? Now! 
we did not uh, take steps to whip up war feeling in, among the American people. For example, we didn't parade military units through our cities. We didn't send pretty movie stars out to factories to sell bonds. All those things that were done during World War II. And one reason we did not was that we thought, thought that in a nuclear world, it's too dangerous for an entire people to become too angry. Now, this creates a problem because we were trying to do in cold blood what we were asking our men on the battlefield to do in hot blood. You know, they tried to make the war to higher ups did so that they could play the war as long as they could with as little bit of um, friction from back home, from the mothers back home. Play the war as a nice war. I mean, they gave people R&Rs. They, they did everything in Vietnam with the Vietnam War, but try to win the damn thing. Had the United States determined that the outcome of events in South Vietnam at that time were of vital interest to the United States, that then we should have been prepared to, and indeed, we should have dedicated the full range of our national power to bring about a successful outcome. We had as fine a military force as America has ever assembled a force that could have brought the war to an end if it hadn't been for political decisions that prohibited that. I think the leadership of some future day will have to consider whether um, maximum force must not be used at the very beginning. One could make an argument now that, as far as Vietnam was concerned, that when President Kennedy decided to uh, make a fight for Vietnam and not for Laos, that he should have put in 100,000 troops immediately, put in a stack of blue chips straight away in order to try to make it clear to the people in Hanoi that we were going to take this very seriously. America sent half a million troops. The military wanted 200,000 more. And of course, if we'd chosen to use it all and to use our full power, we could have absolutely demolished it. As General May said, we could have bombed them back to the Stone Age. The notion that some more incremental aid, that $750 million more, 200,000 more troops would have turned it around, I think is preposterous. Frankly, I think the, the loss of the war really stemmed from the fact that the Americans had misinterpreted the nature of the war for so many years, sent 550,000 American soldiers over there to fight the war, which really was the, not the right reaction to what was the, the nature of the war, then we became impatient when the soldiers weren't able to find the enemy and eliminate the, the threat. Damn snapper out there. Damn man. Drop, drop back about five meters, five meters. You read about wars, you hear about wars, and some people are killed and wounded in wars, but you never think it's going to be you. We ended up shooting at monkeys one night. We, did, we were so scared. 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 I didn't think in terms of that much of really if I was going to be able to come back home, or if I came back home, I'd be in one piece. But because of the flames, I was panicked. And I was screaming, and I was trying to climb and scale this cliff, and I kept slipping back into the flames, and they were all over me. It's monotonous. It's monotony punctuated by moments of sheer terror. was a hit and miss. It was like hunting a hummingbird. You'd, you'd go to one village, nothing there, another village, nothing there, nothing there, and the enemy, the hunting hummingbird we were after was just buzzing around. No knowledge of what the enemy was after. No knowledge of what I was after as a soldier, what my purpose was. Um, you secure a village, you search it, and you leave, and the village reverts to the enemy. Um, it seemed a senseless strategy, and yet, uh, I thought perhaps there's some rhyme or reason behind it. I never found out. To this day, I haven't found out. The Vietnam War begins to lose popular support in the United States in 1968, the same year Bardstown sends its men. I said that the opposition to the war would begin to develop when they were sending bodies back, not to Louisville, Kentucky, and Memphis, and New York, where you know nobody in the next block knows that, that somebody's dead, or in the next house, 
But when they begin to come back into towns of five or 10,000 or smaller communities, that, that these are historic events in a town of that size, that so-and-so's son has been brought back dead and been buried here, that this would, would make the county papers and the smaller papers, and eventually something would happen in the country. It was about a week after his death that his body arrived. It arrived on Sunday night. They went and picked him up on Sunday night. And they found out that he was an open casket. They even stopped by home to tell me that he was back, that I could see him that night. Nearly all local people, you know, we went to school together and played ball together and, you know, the whole work, sure, knew them all. I felt like I had been cheated, and I felt like she had been cheated out of her father, and I was scared. I didn't know whether I could make it or not, or whether I could raise a child by myself. I saw some people um, beg to live. Uh, I saw some people die, and, and, you know, I just questioned myself, well, you know, really, was this worth all of that? And... My biggest relief is I feel that it was his time, it was God's will. I feel that God, that was his time to go that God had set for him to go. Uh, it uh, definitely made me, uh, 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 I think, a better person, no question. It made me really realize what life was about. They, t they were done wrong, all the boys. So first, we didn't know our ally. Secondly, we knew even less about the enemy. I don't know of anybody, never met anybody, who had ever met any of the senior leaders in Hanoi. Uh, we know, knew one or two of them by name, but only by name. Dien Bien Phu to Zuan Lak, San Te to San Mi, the Red River Delta to Con Tum. The Vietnamese roll call covers 30 years and the casualties touch virtually every community. Tet, the Vietnamese New Year, is their Remembrance Day. This is the Vietnamese equivalent of Bardstown. Here, too, the towns and villages have reminders. An estimated two million Vietnamese, south and north, soldiers and civilians, died. Relative to our own population, the North Vietnamese took what for us would have been 10 million killed and continued to sustain the, the effort. At the same time, I think I overestimated the patience of the American people. <clears throat> and I think the real decision to bring this to an end was not made on college campuses or in the streets, but when people at the grassroots, maybe the first half of 1968, came to the conclusion that if we could not tell them when this struggle was going to be over, we might as well chuck it. So it is really the fact that we, were, we were, went wrong in not having a solid basis of knowledge of the essentials of the enemy, our friends, and ourselves. I feel the single greatest cause of America's defeat in Vietnam is that we were backing a weak, traditionalist, half-form formed Southern regime against a highly motivated and ideologically discipli disciplined regime in the North. That it was really the weaknesses 
of the South Vietnamese, their inability to pull themselves together, their incompetence, uh, their corruption, uh, their factionalism. The horse we were backing was not a horse which, without a great deal more flogging, was capable of winning that race. I think that was the single uh, biggest uh, reason why, despite the enormous effort that America put into Vietnam, uh, the outcome uh, was so disastrous. Vietnam seems is the longest, the most unpopular, the uh, most needless, useless, and most mysterious war in American history. We did it out of the finest, highest motives. We did it not for any selfish gain. We did it for no territorial expansion. We thought we could s help save freedom in the world if we got over there. So our theory was right, but what we thought was this spread of Soviet aggression, in my opinion now, seems very clearly to have been a civil war in Vietnam. It was obviously a sad experience for the American people. Uh, whether we should have been there or not is a question I, I, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, we, uh, maybe in hindsight, one would say we shouldn't have been there. To me, the strong feeling that I have now is that the United States should be helpful to its allies all over the world. That's one of our major functions. But we should not get involved, certainly from a standpoint of a military involvement, unless we are very certain that in that particular area, the national security of the United States is at stake. There's those great differences, Americans just can't get away from the idea that we're big and therefore God must have put his hand on our shoulder and we, uh, we wouldn't be so rich if we weren't wise and therefore we must be wise. I think a lot of Vietnam vets are probably more in tune with what we would call patriotism than our government is. I don't think that I'm the loser. I think my government was the loser in that. Well, I'm not sure America did lose in Vietnam. I think that the question of the Vietnamese losing in uh, Vietnam uh, was primarily due to the lack of will and desire of the people of South Vietnam to defend their, their own country. If we'd had any understanding of Vietnam, we'd never got into that. It was a perfectly asinine and insane undertaking. I consider my society a loser. I believe that the real losers were the people of Southeast Asia, the people of Cambodia, the people of Laos. <laughs> so I think it was a great tragedy and a sad chapter in American history. I, I was there for, you know, for over a year and I never developed a love for those people. And uh, maybe I should have, and this is something I need to search for, but I love this country and my country asked me to go. And that's the reason I went, and willingly. And I may have to do it again, someplace else, who knows. 57,000 American troops died in Vietnam. Oh, I think they'll always be remembered. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, we'll never forget it here. You know, we put the monuments on the courthouse square, and uh, especially the ones of us who were involved in it, and definitely all the families, it won't be forgotten here. It can't be, you know, that simple. It's nice, you know, for them to remember them, to put something like that up, but 
you know, something like that. It's not going to bring them back, but it's, you know, it's nice as a town to want to remember them. Well, I remember practically everything as if it was just yesterday. From the time he was a little boy, baby, I don't know. I'll never forget him. Bardstown, a decade later. And central Hanoi, where remembrance chimes sound at noon every day. <laughs> 